get uh get the ball rolling okay very good all right uh i am now going to introduce the program and our guest artist today so welcome to virtual uh virtual artist talk with erica harsh uh, teaching artist in residence, Erica Harsh, who was born in Mexico City and is now based in New York City, is a multidisciplinary artist who employs both traditional and contemporary media and technologies. And I should say she has, uh, she is based in New York City, but she's also moved into the Hudson Valley to join us in Westchester and beyond. So welcome, Erica. <laughs> Uh, through her work, Harsh achieves visual, multisensory, and interactive experiences reflecting on the body, identity, sexuality, and desire. She includes entomology research as part of her work, using butterflies as a metaphor for themes such as gender, migration, nationality, and the relationship human beings have with their own nature and fragility. And I know um, that those of you who have seen or have read about uh, or seen any of our online programs about our current exhibit, Border Contos, Sonic Border, can see the connection between that exhibit and the themes of Erica's work. Uh, and she is the teaching artist in residence uh, in conjunction with that exhibition. So we're going to join the artist today for an illustrated talk about her creative aesthetic and ideological journey. And it will be followed by Q&A uh, from you, the audience. I encourage you all throughout the program, throughout her presentation, to type your comments and your questions in the chat. And at the end, they'll be addressed uh, uh, by Olivia, my uh, colleague, who will be moderating the chat. And I, by the way, I'm Sarah Linda Licklow, Director of Education here at the Hudson River Museum. Uh, I also would like to thank our sponsor, Art Bridges, for this presentation and uh, for supporting Erica's residency throughout the course of the exhibition. Now a little more about Erica's bio. Uh, she was raised, born and raised in Mexico City and has lived in Italy, Germany, and Brazil. Erica's solid background as a painter has been essential and visible in her dis interdisciplinary practice. Her pieces are infused with multi-layered references, meanings, and multiple narratives concerned with individual and cultural preoccupations as well as critical social, political, and environmental issues. She's established a fertile and captivating language using tools such as painting, sculpture, photography, video, animation, installation, interactive projects, and the creation of multimedia shows. And a little bit later, I'll mention a few more uh, programs that she'll be doing for us that utilize these various mediums. Between 2003 and 2017, Harsh's work has been included in international biennials in Frankfurt, Germany, Lodz, Poland, Beijing, China, Seoul, South Korea, Houston, Texas, and Monterrey, Mexico. It has also been featured in many solo and group exhibitions, including shows at the Denver Art Museum, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, the Whitney Museum of American Art and Museo del Barrio in New York City, the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut, the Newberger Museum of Art in Purchase, New York, the Belleville, Bellevue Art Museum in Washington, Museo de Arte Contemporaneo de Querétaro, Mexico, at uh, the Gutenberg Kunstmuseum in Sweden, the Musée de la Photographie in Charleroi, Belgium, and the Seoul Museum of Art in South Korea, among others. So now that you know a little bit more about uh, our teaching artist in residence, Erica Harsh, I invite her to the podium to begin her presentation. Erica, thank, thank you, you so much you. for being with us. It's our privilege to have you here today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for taking the time of this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I'm here in Garrison, uh, upstate New York. Um, I recently have moved my studio to Cold Spring area, so I'm very excited to, to be part of this fantastic Hudson Valley Hudson River area with a lot of history and a lot of beautiful landscape and inspirational things where a lot of artists have actually 
um, made this uh, scenario their home. Uh, thank you for the Hudson River Museum. It's such a, a beautiful opportunity to share with you in the frame, during the frame of the exhibition Border Cantos that makes a fabulous approach of music and visuals at the border of Mexico and United States. And probably a lot of you know that I have been also creating projects through the last, uh, I would say, 10 years uh, about migration and also the border of Mexico and US. I'm a Mexican artist, I'm an immigrant, and I, I have very different backgrounds and Obviously, being a Mexican in the United States, uh, I had endured through the hardships of acquiring visas and, and immigration status. So being akin to this process made me really create projects that, that not only talk about my own personal experience, but really touch the core and the soul of all the people that have to migrate to create a better life or to find better opportunities. And in the saddest situations of many people around the world that have to, that are displaced and are looking for better territories to create a life. I'm gonna share with you a video presentation, I mean, a, a visual presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk about uh, how I started to to create these projects, but mainly something that uh, it's very important if you follow these three months of residence at the museum, um, I invited these fabulous filmmakers and producers of a documentary called Nomads or Nomadas that uh, really have a, a fabulous uh, big scope of animals that migrate and share the territories of United States, uh, Canada, and some Southern territories from Mexico, but actually receive animals in Mexico. And uh, so we're talking about the need of migrating and crossing borders to find best circumstances in different territories. So as uh, all these species um, find for better circumstances, the monarch butterfly, which is this fabulous, uh, I say fabulous a lot, <laughs> this incredible insect that uh, flies from Canada west and east through United States and arrive to this very specific spot in Mexico to do hibernation uh, for three months um, and this monarch butterfly is been in the center core of my projects. The monarch butterfly has been uh, employed in different projects, but the, main, the, the, the very interesting thing is that I share somehow a path of migration as a monarch butterfly with a beautiful thing that the monarch butterfly doesn't need to, to have a passport, obviously, to, to cross through these countries. So I will start um, the presentation. So the monarch butterfly, uh, the monarch paradigm migration as metaphor. So mm, obviously you have seen now uh, or lately a lot of uh, relationship with the monarch butterfly for migration and a lot of people have used the symbol of the butterfly to the monarch butterfly to talk about free migration and more a more comprehensive or or generous uh, approach to immigration in the United States and Mexico border so the first project i did with the monarch butterfly um, was a video installation that i tried to recreate the sanctuary of the monarchs in Mexico Michoacan and after that, I created a passport that unifies precisely these three different countries of the North American continent that encompass this, this uh, incredible uh, and unique uh, natural migration phenomenon and unifying these this, um, three different countries uh, that also are the countries that are part of the NAFTA treaty 
So here you see on, on, on the left side of the screen, the passport project of the United States of North America, on the top of the Canadian, in the center of the monarch, then you see the eagle of the United States passport, and then the, the cactus and the leaves that holds the eagle that is also in the Mexican passport, but the three encompass this um, unique uh, borderless sort of utopian passport. So all started, my interest with the butterflies started with uh, some uh, uh, literary references that uh, I, I use uh, from Vladimir Nabokov, an entomologist, and uh, I, I'm going to say, Olivia, there are some people that are trying to get in the, in the, okay, sorry. No, I got it, don't worry. <laughs> I see the, the, the pop-up of the admissions. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted to use the butterfly as a, uh, as an element that would be full of concept and, and ideas to transform into human necessities uh, and, and to address different aspects of humanity, which is identity, sexuality, nationality, and, and social economical aspects. Because when we're born, we're, we're already placed in sort of an inset of, of uh, predetermined factors that without you doing nothing, you arrive in this world and you're already, you're born with a, with a gender, you're born in a country and you're born in a certain socioeconomical uh, place. But thanks to migration, you can transform and move and, and navigate under, uh, through these uh, uh, aspects that are predetermined to transform yourself into a whole different um, human being or in different circumstances. Oops, I cannot, oh, okay. So I started uh, this project with an entomologist who was an entomologist in charge of the natural, the collection of uh, Lepidopteras, at the Natural History Museum of New York. And with him, I started this fan fantastic adventure that lasted for almost 10 years of my career would I employ butterflies. I did a deep research with him to create uh, parallel realities uh, within the, uh, the humanity and butterflies. And also this uh, scientific approach with him made me um, incorporate the entomology into my own practice. And little by little, I created this uh, vocabulary and visual language with butterflies into my world that was very, very closely tied to uh, entomology. So this is part of all the practices I did with him and research. He has himself a fantastic collection of, of butterflies, his personal museum. So all this was part of being working with him. So as I said, I use the butterflies to talk about identity and gender and sexuality, nationality and social economical aspects. So I also use the butterfly to address um, economic aspects and also talk about mobility as financial mobility, global economies. So as you see, my practice is very close tied to entomological boxes, cutting specimens and butterflies and and uh, you know the the very meticulous painting, gluing, cutting, attaching, bending paper to simulate the wings of the butterflies. So this was the first project called Imagos, where I used the the I photographed many many different species from oh, different countries, and then in the center of the butterfly, I fused with a photograph. It was a digital manipulation. I fused with the butterfly with, I mean, the wings of the butterfly from a specific country with the genitalia of a woman that had migrated to United States in New York and that would match from the same country of origin as the butterfly. So this project, the Imagos, also has been presented in many different countries. And since I, I, I employ butterflies from many countries and, and the representation of, of, of female freedom, uh, empowerment through owning of sexuality. And I 
I employ the monarch butterfly and being myself Mexican and the monarch butterfly being a representation of the Mexican identity, that's when I started to work with the monarch butterfly. And after that, I did a trip to the monarch sanctuary, um, um, to the monarch butterfly sanctuaries in Michoacan, Mexico during the time on migration. And that's when I started uh, this project that was, um, I would say one of the most uh, powerful experiences in my life. I invited a sound artist, uh, Edmund Money, that recorded the sound of the butterflies because I wanted to do a representation, a multimedia representation of this, uh, of this sanctuary. The first time that I, I arrived to this uh, uh, sanctuary, there was a freeze. So 40% of the population of butterflies had died. So you walk on the forest and there were, uh, it was a carpet of dead butterflies. And then in the sky, you had this saturation of, of the flight of hundreds of thousands of butterflies. So if you think that butterflies don't make a, a, a sound or music with their wings, with the fluttering, but hundreds of thousands of them flying at the same time, the sound is almost like a waterfall. And uh, we went on a, on a on a, with, a, with a crew of uh, an amazing assistant, Gabriela Cristo and Edmund Mooney. And uh, we were there for five days filming and recording the sound and gathering um, the, the, that, uh, that fascinating, uh, I would say, how, how can you transmit that nature into a sort of an artificial recreation and it was then when I was laying on the floor photographing and finding spaces like kind of windows through the trees to capture uh, just the, the butterflies with the sky where I realized that I, I was going through the same pattern of migration and I wanted to recreate those, those uh, somehow to create an identity of the monarch butterfly. That's when I had the idea of doing the passport. But um, then um, I was able to fly through, through the uh, sanctuaries, I mean, on top of the sanctuaries with, uh, with Vico uh, Gutierrez, who followed the migration of the butterflies uh, from Canada through the uh, through United States and finally arriving through Mexico all the three months of the flying. So at the end of the, of the recording of uh, making all the material for being on the field for Eros Thanatos, that video installation, he invited me to fly on, on this uh, ultralight that he painted, Papalotzin. Uh, uh, he named uh, the ultralight Papalotzin, and we flew on top of the, of the trees of the sanctuaries. So this is Eros Thanatos, the video installation, which uh, it's uh, an installation with film sound and, and, and a the floor that is covered with butterflies. Um, so for me, it was very important to, to recreate that sensation of a life cycle when you join death and life. So that's what it's called Eros and Thanatos, which is literally death and life. And, the, and, and ourselves being the center of this life cycle and that understanding of our passage through life and and power and fragility and adaptation and transformation. So as I mentioned in this video installation, I tried to recreate this sanctuary uh, where, where I encountered the dead butterflies on the floor. And at the end, the, the video, and, and you enter in this space and you have the sound, the surrounding sound of the butterflies fluttering. And then it, this is uh, uh, the first maquette I did, and this is the video. I'm gonna pause a little bit. I, maybe you can hear the sound. So oh, the, the, the film that you're gonna see later, Nomads, uh, if you continue the process of the residency, you're gonna see a whole different new uh, film. But here, for me, I wanted to emphasize only on, on, on this mesmerizing movement of the butterflies without any other reference but the sky and, and, and the, 
uh, Vivacious, uh, you know, completely unique way of flying and fluttering at the same time with the uh, flat, passive sort of in, uh, impermanence of the dead of, of the butterflies on the floor. So people enter to the installation and they activate the floor. And by the activation of the, uh, of the floor and touching the butterflies, they actually devastate the, the floor of, uh, or, or the monarch. So that, that happens with us, our interventions with uh, uh, our intervention in, in, in landscapes, in environment, we devastate the environment by our need of constantly invade the, the the, the 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 natural environment so and and the butterflies get actually folded and and uh, to create volume in advance to the show so five days before each exhibition i gather uh people that volunteer to fold the butterflies and uh and then we we place them on the floor but this this folding of the butterflies create a, a, with, with the volunteers create a, a, a very good recognition of, of conversations and how we interact with our natural environment and, and how we devastate uh, the, the, you know, our world. But also it was a, a very unique discovery the first time that I presented this at the Photo Fest Biennial in Houston, a diverse works how it really touches the fibers of, of children, adults, you know, when, when, they, when they touch something that it's, it's almost like, like being there in, in, in the sanctuary of the monarchs. So it, it, it's very unique how, how people react and how this uh, interactive and this experiential process of adaptation and, and and here I'm here. I'm showing how the installation gets done. This is in Charleroi. This is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the piece really—it's almost a med meditation sort of experience, um, where you can understand how fragile this this natural process is. It's also very playful because, you know, the, the sound of crushing the butterflies and throwing them, making them looking like they're flying. And then at the same time, you listen to this very unique sound uh, of the real actual butterflies. And we all, we all are very akin to butterflies. The butterfly reference is it's very easy to to assimilate, but here the butterfly in, in the context of my projects is full of, of meaning and significance. Um, I didn't mention also that every single butterfly that you see right in the center has a female genital. So we have here many layers of representation and, and many layers of, of perception of the, the dichotomies of the female, the male, civilization, nature, and that juxtaposition of, of symbols and power and abuse and devastation. Here is in the border of Luxembourg and, uh, and Belgium. And I, the curator and me decided to contain the piece within a unit of travel, a unit of, uh, of immigration of, of products. And here having the artificial butterflies um, I didn't mention, sorry, uh, that the butterflies are 60,000 of printed butterflies in um, polycarbonate. So they really look, they, they simulate the looking of the butterflies, the real actual butterflies that are kind of translucent and they make the same kind of, of sound when you crush them. So as I mentioned before, after being in the sanctuary, I decided to create the, the passport of the United States of North America with the emblematic representation of the monarch. Uh, so this piece, how it works, it's a, a simulation, a simulacrum of a passport office where uh, you enter, you apply, you have an application, 
you, you fill the application and that entitles you to spin a wheel of fortune with the possibility to actually win a passport. And, um, and you, you go through a process that uses all the, the wording and all the semiotics that are employed in, in, a, in an application for, for a visa or a passport. So it plays with this, with, with this process that it, it really plays with the psychology of people in, in, and, and the wording of alien, uh, you're not eligible, this kind of feeling that, that you belong or you not belong. So it was a, a, a very precise study through, through many months of how to, to use all this real wording into this sort of utopian scenario of the possibility of creating a very unified uh, North American continent. So this is the Wheel of Fortune. And uh, as, as, as you know, when we're, we're born, we, it, it's not the same if you're born in uh, United States or you're born in Mexico or you're born in uh, Finland or you're born in Japan or you're born in Senegal or you're born in Syria or you're born in Sweden, you know, or Switzerland or, you know, every place it's going to, where you, um, it's very different. And if you're born in, in a specific country, that definitely is going to, to define who you are. And that's by chance. So I, I studied a lot of this birthright citizenship that um, somehow plays a, a fact of fortune of a lot of options and possibilities of every single person's development. So playing with this fortune aspect, I created this passport. And the, act, the passport actually has all these uh, pages that, uh, was worked through a whole process of recreating line by line, you know, to mimic, to, to somehow recreate an actual passport. The visas, every single stamp and every, 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 every visa, every symbol is somehow mimicking, as you see on, on the left side, the visa, it's, it, it shows the migration pattern of, of, through the North American continent of the monarch butterfly. And on the right, what my approach here is to, to somehow see immigration in, in a more natural, uh, uh, comprehensive way, somehow like restoring the natural, uh, the cyclical pattern of migration of entrance and return so, so the, such as the monarch that goes uh, back and forth in, in accordance to, uh, to, their, to, to, their, to their needs. So this is the NAFTA treaty turning to a stamp, uh, human rights, and uh, here are the people at the installations that you're gonna see at the, at the museum. I'm gonna do a performance in May uh, with the passport piece installation that people would arrive, apply, spin the wheel of fortune with the possibility of getting out of the installation with your actual passport. And again, it's, it's a, a matter of being lucky or, or uh, fortunate to, to get it. Oops. Uh oh. <laughs> so this is in the city of Łódź in Poland, where the first time that, that I brought the passport piece out of the context of a museum, a gallery, an art fair, and it was actually inset in, in one of the most important, uh, well, the most important street in, in, in the city of Łódź, but was one of the most important uh, streets commercial streets in, in the past in Eastern Europe. And in this context, it was placed in a, in a complete uh, surprising scenario that it's somehow weaved within the, the, the context of, of the social uh, weaving of a city. And people imagined that it was, a lot of people thought it was a real passport office where they could go and apply. A lot of people arrive with their photographs, 
with their family members, even though we never mislead the, 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 the visitors or the viewers, we explain this is an art project, it was part of a biennial. And, but we invite people to reflect, to, to share their, their thoughts, their feelings, uh, and, and we recognize that uh, migration, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter the country you're in, it's, it's really the, the, the possibility of moving, of traveling, more and more it's, it's part of, of the world we live in, the need of, uh, we live in a, in a world of constant mobility. So it really grows, uh, you know, by, 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 by the, the viewers being in, 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 in this uh, installation, you, you see how um, it touches every single person and basically every visitor by activating the piece, it, it, it transforms the meaning of, of the piece and, and creates their own experience and completes the, the, the concept of the piece by that precise activation that becomes very, very personal. And we encounter all kind of reactions, all kind of experiences. I serve most of the times as the passport officer. People get sometimes very excited. Some people get very sad. Some people think that by, by doing this might be an omen to complete or get finally their visas or their passports, whatever process they're going through in whatever countries they're going through. And here, this was the second time that the piece was actually presented in this social carpet of a city. And uh, this is in El Paso, Texas. And, and, and this is at El Paso Street. Right, uh, you can see at the end of, uh, of the image, uh, the Santa Fe crossing border, uh, the international border bridge which is the second most uh, traffic populated bridge in the border of United States and Mexico. And, uh, and here by inserting the, this pop-up uh, passport office within this very unique scenario where the need of, of migrating, the need of papers, this uh, by nationality sort of crossroad this uh, dual nationality situation, it was uh, incredibly interesting, the reaction of people. Some people thought we were La Migra, some people were, were real uh, immigration officers, some people uh, thought that finally they were going to be able to get a paper, which was really strong and really powerful. That actually made me rethink also on the approach and, and, and enrich the, the, the content of the piece tremendously because that experience of people, people sharing, uh, we do interviews, we have people writing and uh, sharing uh, their process or incredibly enriches the, the, I would say the, not only the piece itself, but the, the archiving of experiences of, of people within the piece eventually would be something that would be in a, in a collection as a sort of survey, survey or sort of a archival of experiences of many different people. And uh, as, as I said, it, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your age, but this possibility of having that traveling piece, uh, you know, when it was presented in China, the, the fortune aspect of, uh, of having a, a passport and have like a, a piece of America, you know, they didn't care much about Mexico, but they care about America. But when, when it was done at the border, it was a very different cultural and uh, uh, it was charged with a different meaning. And as I say, it doesn't matter where you place this, if it's in an art scenario, if it's in a museum as here, it's at the Aldrich Museum, or if it's somewhere else in the street. We have done this also in art fairs, in street fairs where you have hot dogs and, and uh, 
you know, fair uh, wheel, uh, roller wheel coasters or whatever you call it. So it's been in, in many different contexts and scenarios for every kind of uh, nationality age. Here are the currency kites where papalotes, the word in Nahuatl, the ancient tongue of the Aztecs, the word for butterfly is uh, papalotzin. And we have in Spanish, the word for kite, we adapted that as papalote. So when I was working with the butterfly uh, uh, it, it, and, and the currency, um, the um, images of currency embedded in, in, in the, the shape of the butterflies, it was immediate that I, I wanted to, to make um, kites with, uh, with the butterflies to address volatile currency markets. And I, I turned these this, uh, currency butterflies into kites and talk about obviously uh, the finance world, I did this this uh, this piece of uh, Mao uh, dragon and the dollar currency kites uh, right after the financial meltdown, and it was also a performance in uh, in very close to to the financial um, um, sort of uh, epicenter. I mean, the the epicenter of the financial meltdown uh, in in Wall Street, New York. And it, these kites work as installation or work as performances where the dragon chases the dollars, talking about these uh, superiorities of economies, Chinese and American. And here is uh, uh, the performance where there's a flutist playing uh, kind of through this, this metaphor of the, the enchanting flute mo moving animals are moving in this in this sense insects and here i play with also the the playful aspect of currency and having the currency as kites and we're i we don't know if we're pulling the strings of of money or money is pulling the strings of of of, of uh, humanity this has been also as i mentioned presented as installation or live performance where, where uh, we move the kites to music. We're here, we have Claire Chase playing the flute at National Southeast to the very beginning of the, of the construction site of a really incredible uh, venue in Williamsburg in New York, a musical venue. The currency butterflies are also wall installations that talk about the flow of economies. And then going back to the border. So this is how the butterfly process started and, and went through talking about immigration. And then after talking about immigration, it was undeniable to keep on, on going deep and talk about the more, the more complex circumstances of immigration that we've been seeing in the last, uh, five years in in United States or the last decade. Um, in 2014, I saw, uh, well, I'm gonna talk about this image first. So I got very interested in, in going to the border of Mexico and United States. So I did five years of, of travels and photographing research precisely at the border of, uh, El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, Chihuahua. I was invited to the Rubin Center of the Visual Arts, part of the El Paso, Texas University, and the um, University of Texas, El Paso. And I did the passport installation there for the first time uh, where you saw it at the street, and I also did it at the Rubin Center. And that was the first time that I, that I visited the, the city and I got completely uh, taken by this binational cross-culture, cross-nationality scenario that it's very unique in its, in its, in, in its um, type. Also, you have it in, in Tijuana and San Diego, but this very unique scenario and I met really great people and photographers and friends and it, 
grow in a very, very deep way in my heart and my connection. So I kept on going very often during five years and, and photographed the evolution of the border at, at that very unique space. So on the top, you see the, a satellite view of the Landsat 2 of NASA of the, the scar of the border, both geographically and the imposition of an artificial border um, right at El Paso, Texas, and Chihuahua, uh, Ciudad Juarez, going to uh, New Mexico. So you here you see the scenario. The children that you see down, down was on my very first trip. That was how the wall, the famous unpenetrable wall, was like at the place called uh, <laughs> Talk so much that I, uh, I'll, the name will come in a second. So it was, uh, you know, before these these people, their backyard was the 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 side of the border. There was Anapra. Anapra was uh, it's the name of this very unique space. So children used to to play and and way before people were crossing every day, people were going to work back and forth. Still, they're doing it. But the, the, the border has been tightened and tightened and tightened, and it became a, a, an almost impenetrable sort of circumstance. In 2014, there was an unprecedented circumstance that uh, unaccompanied children came to the border. 10,000 children unaccompanied came to the border, and the United States didn't know how to handle. Sadly, these children, uh, these children were looking for asylum. And if you think of how, uh, if we go back through history, how families send their children on ships from Europe to go on a company to United States to find the possibility to start a new life and, and parents sacrificed and sent children by themselves. The same happened in 2014 where children uh, were sent on a company to the border and uh, the way sadly the way it was handled was that they created these detention centers for an, for unaccompanied undocumented children and they placed them in these uh, jails that were that are handled by uh, incarceration corporations that are lucrative so when I saw this image that now we're all very familiar but in, two, in 2014, very few people saw these images and uh, it captivated, it, it really broke my heart. And I started working on this project under the same sky we dream. That as well, I, I, I have this tendency to, to create, a, well, not tendency, but it's part of my language, to create an artificial scenario that somehow recreates a reality or a natural scenario that would make you reflect uh, in, in, in a reality that is full of meaning and full of, of sometimes drama as it is in this case. So the way the installation works is a screen with a video. It's a rear projection screen of a PVC material with a video in this case is a time lapse of the clouds of a uh, film from dawn to sunset in the vicinity on the, at the border. So the clouds, as the butterflies, they pass uh, you know, through the, 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 the artificial demarcation of, of borders. And then you see this, this time lapse made out of more than 35,000 still photographs. And then the, the shape of the screen is cut out with the shape of the border of United States and Mexico. And then you pass through to, to, to encounter, you know, the sad scenario of the detention centers. So people are invited to activate, this, activate the space. And those actual uh, mylar blankets are the, the mylar blankets that are given to the children to cover. And those uh, floor pads are the actual floor pads used by detention centers to accommodate um, uncomfortably, uncomfortably and, and not really safely accommodate the children. And the people go into this, this scenario to, to somehow uh, reflect and, and, and feel what, you know, 
the, the space that these children are finding. And the book has a documentation of five years at the border and it has this light and the, the book that you, that, that you have there, it's called the dream book. Almost, uh, I'm, I'm here appealing to, to all the mothers and all the children that are going to, to see, uh, I mean, that are without each other and the dream book of, of, of this, this dream of the, the American dream, but also like a mother reading this book to their children at night and, uh, and, and having this reflection of the possibility of, of a new life. And the sound in the installation, while you're there, you're listening to the Dream Act uh, of the Bill of Congress that was never passed to give the possibility of a, of a path to, to legal migration to these children that were brought not only in this case scenario, but children have been bringing that have been brought to United States since a long time ago, and uh, and not having um, the possibility to to have you know uh, a passport or uh, a, a legal status. So here you see how the border was. Here you see how the border is today. And these children are the same children that are counted long time ago, border patrol. You, here you see the, the, the border the way it is today. And it says, ni delincuentes ni ilegales. Somos trabajadores internacionales. Not delinquent, not illegal. We're international workers. Here you see the scar of the border on the landscape. And here is Mago Serrera who, created the beautiful song of uh, the Dream Act with her voice. Uh, I grabbed the, the, the exact text of the, the Bill of Congress, the Dream Act, and I turned it into lyrics for a song that she created a beautiful song with her voice, her melodic voice that somehow is that dream and the mother singing to the lost child. So here I finish my... Uh, my presentation and I open the floor, <laughs> the virtual floor to questions and, and ideas, whatever you, you want. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erica. So if you guys would like, you are welcome to put your questions in the chat and I will facilitate those questions towards Erica. Um, so, I mean, obviously, for me as a question, um, obviously your uh, exhibitions are very clearly politically driven and well, you know, often I see butterflies, monarch butterflies in particular used as a uh, subtle nod to this uh, issue. What made you uh, be so clear in your message with your art and what, and, and why is that message so important for everyone to hear? Well, I think the clarity became when I was on the verge to become undocumented myself. Uh, there was, I would say that it, ha it happened to me and it happens to a lot of artists that our own personal experience um, most of the times reflect the, the globe, I mean, other people's experience. So from the singular and particular, I wanted to transform this into a more global and to a more generalized sort of life circumstance. So instead of staying with my own personal uh, experience or drama or, or circumstance, I wanted to to bring this and, and talk how this reflects into many other people. And at the end, I was very lucky and, and privileged to handle and meander through this very circumstance situation, but so many people are not that fortunate. So for me, it was also very, very important to give voice to the ones that don't have a voice, to bring out um, the circumstance of the people that are less uh, fortunate in, in such uh, a complicated situation which is uh, having a, a, a passport, having a visa, or when people migrate 
uh, as when when I was in Syria and I met a lot of people that sadly they had to to find a new country because they were they were fleeing for because of war and there's nothing wrong with them as so many people think you know uh, they could be dangerous but there's people like you and me and everybody that are just looking for a safer place where to live or people coming from El Salvador or other countries that are in, in very hard circumstances, both humanitarian or political, but they are all as I was looking for better opportunities. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, we have a question from Sarah Linda. She says, what an emotion laden experience your passport office is. What techniques have you employed to deal with people's reactions and how have your audiences reacted to their fellow participants? Well, that passport office, uh, I, I would say it, it's interesting because uh, it depends on where each project is presented, uh, depends on the country, depends on the context, depends on, on on the time also, as we evolve in time, you know, each project becomes definitely more timely or less timely or more risky. Uh, I remember once um, when I did the passport, uh, a person approached me and, and, and was very, very angry. And said, like, thanks to people like you, we have all this undocumented because you're favoring this and you're promoting and, and was really, really angry. Uh, other people have cried, other people get very excited. You know, also one time I, I, I would say more, one of the experiences that really stayed with me when a woman came with, with her child and said, uh, went through the whole process and said, would you give my child a passport please? He lost on the, on the fortune wheel, but why don't you just give the passport so he doesn't cry? And I said, I cannot because my position here is, it's actually the position of a, of a process that sometimes in life doesn't have a happy ending. It doesn't have a happy result. And, uh, and probably this is a teaching moment for you with your child to explain how probably fortunate he is that he actually holds an American passport by birthright citizenship, but others don't. And this is a very unique moment for you to teach him that in life, we not always win. And in life, others are not as privileged or fortunate. And it was very, very strong. Uh, and, you know, others really pray almost before they spin the wheel of fortune to get the passport because they are probably applying for others, I had very more than than obviously ten people, but a lot of undocumented people that had played the game in many different circumstances, in many different cities, and many different countries. That they actually, at the end, they come to me and say, "Like, do you know that I'm undocumented? Thank you for bringing this." So heartbreaking situations and. Others very happy, people get angry, people get joyful. Thank you so much. Um, again, if you have any questions or any uh, thoughts you would like to share, you feel what you're more than welcome to share them in the chat. We would love to hear from you. Um, Olivia, thank you. Yeah, we're um, while we wait, uh, I know this was, oh, we have one new message. Here we go. Oh. Would you like to read that, Sarah Linda? Sure. This is from Liz Rodriguez, um, who is one of our docents. She's waving. Thank you, Liz. Uh, does your work ever touch on the role of the U.S. Go the U.S. government has played in creating this immigration fight from Central America? Thank you, Liz, for your question. Well, uh, they. The aspect of my work is it's more about raising questions. Uh, I'm not uh, an activist or an artivist. I, I'm an artist and with every project I hope to 
to bring awareness, to make people reflect and uh, and kind of try to to open their their scope on on the knowledge of a pro of, of a of a real circumstance. So I'm I'm not trying to judge anybody. It's a very very complex situation. The immigration conundrum it's uh, very complicated. I by learning and learning more through the years about it, uh, I understand both sides of the equation and every side of the equation it's very complicated um and it's not for me to judge or to or to say if it's wrong or not wrong obviously we know the things that are systemically wrong uh the incarceration corporation it's very very black and scary and we know it's not for me to say it but we know that there are definitely some policies that need to be changed and um, and the, the the sad part is that uh, the most vulnerable human circumstance is the profit of others and that's very wrong um, the situation of, of immigration, obviously countries that are in, in, in war or countries that offer really bad circumstances to their nationals, obviously the problem, the problem starts right there. It's not the problem at the border, but the problem of corruption and, uh, and a country offering uh, bad circumstance to the people that live there, it's the beginning of the problem. So. I'm not there here to, to come to conclusions. I'm not here to, to, as I said, judge whether something is good or not, or, or I'm not an activist. I'm not a, gonna die on the line for, for a, a purpose in this sense, but, uh, but it's for me to, to raise questions and make people more aware of a circumstance where people are really suffering. Erica, thank you. Thank you. And Liz, thank you so much for that question. Just, you know, looking at the way you word the question, the very use of the word flight, I think, takes us back to the metaphor of, of the monarch butterfly and everything that, that Erica has shown us today in terms of transcending borders. Um, and, and that's something that we're going to be exploring throughout the exhibition. Um, we have another um, comment. Should I take that, uh, yeah, Olivia? Some from Gabriela Rosso. Uh, we are in the month of women. How pertinent do you think the message that the imagos convey continues to be today, especially since femicides increase every day? You are not an, an activist, I think, or I believe that's the word you mean, but your, but your work with the Imagos addresses the transverse, transversality of feminism and migration. Thank you for that, Gabriella. Uh, Erica, do you want to respond to yeah, that? Absolutely. And thank uh -huh. you, Gabriella, for that fabulous question. And it's very relevant. And uh, I didn't touch much the Imago projects, with, which is the, the very, very first project that made me open up this window of endless possibilities with the butterflies, which is the Imagos, the butterflies with female genitals in the center, which is, was the very, very first project that I touched about immigration. We were focusing in, in, um, in this talk more into the border because of the, the the synchronicity with the Border Cantos exhibition now at the uh, Hudson River Museum. But yes, uh, the very, very first project, the Imagos, that I did almost uh, 18 years ago, touching genitalia in, in, in the metaphorical way, like using uh, images of female genitalia was very, very strong, was, were, were, was still something that you know, I suffer censorship uh, in Syria, in, in the city of Aleppo. I suffer censorship 
the Nevada Museum of Art. And um, it's been a very delicate process. However, by adding the genital in the middle of wings, it's, it's the, the core of female freedom and power. It touches vulnerability, it touches strength. So how the core of identity of, of femininity uh, it's, it's relevant not only back then, but more so today where we're not anymore, you know, afraid, but we're really as women, you know, strong and talking about openly, you know, talking about our rights and not uh, being uh, abused as also the Eros Thanatos installation of the monarchs with a, the with a genital in the center and people stepping on it that's where that message is not only an environmental project, but it's, it's a project that talks about abuse of the female symbol. So we have the, the entering into that installation with the verticality of civilization, mankind, that, that kind of dichotomy representation, verticality, horizontality, horizontality, meaning female nature, you know, uh, um, creation. So that stepping on the female symbol is, is that part of, of the abuse that women have suffered, that we have suffered. And, uh, and also, um, you know, the, the, the idea of gender identity has definitely transformed, that discourse had definitely transformed. And I'm very happy where the world has taken into this transversality, into this uh, duality, um, non-binary sort of fluidity that uh, that we, 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 we finally have that sort of freedom that the representation of the butterfly with, with the, with the, with the uh, genital for me was always that dream of of freedom in many ways, that that less attached boundaries, less attached uh, uh, links that would would free uh, gender, would free genitals, would free femininity, would free you know borders and and free uh, human beings of of a lot of attachments as nationalities and <laughs> many other things. So it's a very you know, multi-layered, uh, there's so many meanings attached to all the projects. Very great question, Gabriela, thank you. Gabriela, thank you so much. Um, and and also for, now that I see it, artivist for that term. <laughs> um, first time that I've seen it. So thank you for adding that to my vocabulary. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Olivia, were there any other questions or comments that we, oh, Rachel, uh, thank you so much for sharing your incredible work and your process. Um, and I know that there is more because Erica is, is just, um, is such a um, versatile, a uh, skillful artist in so many, so, so many mediums. And, and she really focused today on her work having to do with migration. So um, uh, I think Olivia, let's put the link to, um, to Erica's website in here so people can learn even more about her work. Um, also, uh, do we have any more questions or comments before we um, come to a close? Ah, one you message is that, and that's the one from you. Okay, awesome, Olivia, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I really, there is so much to say. There is so, the, your work is so rich and so uh, beautiful in the way it transforms all of, all of your elements in, into a performative and participatory experience for, for, you know, for your audience. Um, and thank you for taking us through so many of those levels today. I do want to, I did put um, dates for your upcoming programs at the Hudson River Museum. Uh, actually, uh, your next one will be a workshop that's virtual on March 21st. And then uh, on April 24th and May 8th, 
um, will have the opportunity to experience the passport office in person uh, in a safe and socially distanced way in the museum courtyard. And, and it'll be spring, which is amazing. Uh, so Erica will be there and she will also be um, on a panel with the production team of Nomads or Nomadas, uh, as she mentioned, beautiful full length film uh, that we will uh, provide access to for our audiences. I also wanted to call attention to a related program because we were talking a lot about NAFTA um, in relation to the passport uh, project, and there is a really interesting um, program coming up uh, virtual again on Saturday the 13th at two o'clock, featuring Kenneth Smith Ramos, who is the former chief negotiator for the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, and also he'll be in conversation with Enrique Peret, who's director of the US-Mexico Foundation. So I think that will give you another perspective and a little different context for Erica's for Erica's work and her practice. And uh, I do also want to um, just remind everybody that the exhibit which has inspired this residency uh, is on view at the Hudson River Museum through May 9th. Uh, it is Border Cantos Sonic Border, the work of Richard Misrock and Guillermo Galindo, and our chair of the curatorial department, Laura Vukels, who's waving here, right here, will be doing a virtual tour of the exhibit tomorrow at 1.30. So we invite all of you to return. Uh, go to um, our website, register, and come see us again tomorrow and join us for that tour. And um, I will just uh, read Liz's final comment. Thank you, HRM, for providing this excellent program. A wonderful compliment to our current exhibit, as well as Marietta, thought-provoking, imaginative, amazing use of so many images. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all of you, thank you so much for being here, for taking part in the conversation, and for, um, for just setting out on this journey of Erica's residency with all of us. We look forward to seeing you again and have a wonderful weekend and stay well. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Saralinda. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, Hudson River Museum. And <laughs> thank you, everybody, for sharing this uh, beautiful afternoon on a Saturday. Thank you again, Erica, so much. Ciao. Bye bye, everybody.